And some mountains are meant to be moved, and some mountains are meant to be climbed. And today I want to talk about one of those, those mountains that you've got to climb in order to move. And so last week we talked about how you're called to be priest in his holy nation. And God tells Moses this is his plan. And then Peter says the same thing. And we know that God's plan never changes. He's the same God yesterday, today, and forevermore. Sometimes we think, well, you know, I, I hear people tell me stuff all the time. Well, you know, I just feel like I need to do this. Well, the deal is God never changes. God never changes. And his plan for your life really never changes. It's our plans a lot of times that change. And a lot of times we get in the way of God's plan, and, and we wonder why there's moving and there's shifting and why we, we're uneasy. And, and, and the truth is God has a plan for your life. And sometimes we need to keep quit camping out in our plans and get into God's plan because when we get into God's plan, that's when we move into the promised land and we, we enter into the place where, where things get better in our lives. You know, things don't have to be easy to be good. I'm going to say that again. Things don't have to be easy to be good. See, things can be difficult, but when you know who God is and you know what is on the other side of difficult, it's promise. And God gives you the grace to walk through those things. And so Peter says this in 1 Peter 1, 9, but you, are not li- but you are not like that. Look to your neighbor and say you're not like that. For you are a chosen people, a royal priest, a holy nation, God's very own possession. We saw Moses said these same words. God told him this same exact thing. God wants you as his very own. And that has never changed from the beginning of time. You belong to God. Whether you like it or not, whether you believe in God or not, you are God's possession, his very own. And he sent his son just for you because he wanted you to be a chosen people, a royal priest, and a holy nation. Peter says, uh, Moses says you will be. Peter says you are because Jesus fulfilled it. You are. You are a chosen people. No matter what anybody says about you, they can call you all kinds of names. But the only thing that matters is what God says about you. And he calls you son. He calls you daughter. He calls you a chosen people, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation. And so this week we're going to be talking about a different mountain, different story. Probably one of the wildest, most amazing stories in the whole Old Testament. And uh, it's, it's Mount Carmel. It's a showdown between God and an idol. It's a showdown between God's servant and the devil's servant. One of the most evil kings in history. It said, in fact, it says up to the time of his birth, he is the most evil king that had ever ruled. And his wife is known as one of the most evil people in, all, in the whole entire Old Testament. So today I want to talk about Ahab and Elijah and Jezebel. In 1 Kings 16, 29, it says this, Ahab, son of Omri, began to rule over Israel in the 38th year of King Asa's reign in Judah. And he reigned in Samaria 22 years, but Ahab, son of Omri, did what was evil in the Lord's sight. He did what was evil in the Lord's sight. And even more than any of the kings before him, in other words, he's the most evil of all the kings, of all the kings before him even. I think it's important when the Bible tells us key information like this. And as thought, it were not enough to follow the sinful example of Jeroboam. He married Jezebel. In other words, says it wasn't enough for him him to follow in the sinful ways of his forefathers. But he marries Jezebel. I think the only thing worse than having Jezebel is probably a, a wife would have her as a mother-in-law. But Jezebel's this evil, evil person. Jezebel is evil in every way. Now, I've been blessed in my life. And I've always had been surrounded by great women, but he's surrounded by an evil woman. From the time I was a young man, I've had great examples 
uh, of what a man should be and what a woman should be and how they should act. This guy is evil in every way. Jezebel is evil in every way. And it says, he married Jezebel, the daughter of King Ethbal, Bel of the Sidonians. And he began to bow down and worship a Baal. First Ahab built a temple and an altar for Baal in Samaria. And then he set up a share pole. He did more to provoke the anger of the Lord. Listen to this. He did more to provoke the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than any of the other kings of Israel before him. Than any of them. And it probably could have said all of them combined. That's how evil this gentleman was. And then we see in 1 Kings 17 and 1, it says, Now Elijah, who was from Tishbe and Gilead, told King Ahab, As surely as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, the God I serve, there will be no dew or rain during the next few years until I give the word. When he says no rain, not even dew. Zero percent humidity. Zero chance of rain. Emily's uncle was down this week from Minnesota where it was, 20, I think it was 28 below, zero, where he's from. He said, well, you know, I like 28 below better than I like 10 degrees because it's sunshiny and because it's so cold, there's no humidity at all. There's no chance of snow. There's nothing. Just 28 below. No humidity. And... Um, and so this king doesn't have 28 below, but he's got heat, and he's got no rain, no humidity, and no chance of dew. Now, at least when there's dew, you know that you might get some plants to live. There's some form of water. But this means that everything is dying. It's as bad as a curse can just about get. And so for three years, they're in famine. And Ahab is very upset. Lodges out living in the wilderness. He's living by a brook in the wilderness. And there's this raven that will fly in every day and leave him food. And the drought that Elijah talks about is so bad that the brook dries up. And he has to move on. Then he goes to a widow. And this widow and her son have just enough flour and oil for her son and her, herself to eat one cake and then die. And Elijah tells the lady, make me a cake first. You know, that's faith when God tells you, just give me everything that you've got left. You're, you're down to your last meal and you're going to die. You're worried about if you, you, you know you and your son are going to die. How, how is it that this lady's looking at her kid and saying, well, the prophet of the Lord said, give me the cake. But you know what? The truth is she had nothing to lose. She was at a play, place of such desperation. She was going to die anyway. I might as well give the prophet of the Lord and see if he can do anything with me. The last of what I have. We worry about what we have. Sometimes. Well, will it be enough if I trust God? This lady was in a desperate place. She said, you know what? I'm not even going to have my last meal. I'm going to give it to God. And she did. She gave it to the prophet. And you know what? The oil and the flour, it never ran dry. Because when you learn how to trust God, your, your provision will always be there. Because when you tap into the source of your provision anyway, you don't worry about it. The problem is we look at provision and we think it's the source when really he's the source. And when we learn how to tap into the source, you never run without. So God does a miracle and it never runs out until the famine ends. And then in chapter 18, we see God tells Elijah it's time. And God tells him to tell Ahab there will be rain. Now, Ahab is big mad. He and his wife, Jezebel, have tried to kill all of God's prophets. And they've been successful at killing about three-quarters of them. And they've searched everywhere for Elijah that they know where to look, and they can't find him. We read in 1 Kings 18, 16, if you'll open with me. 
And it says, so Obadiah went to tell Ahab that Elijah had come. That's enough to get Obadiah killed right there. And Ahab went out to meet Elijah. And when Ahab saw him, he exclaimed, so is it really you, you troublemaker of Israel? You know what's funny as a pastor? I've been called a troublemaker before. The truth is, I just want you to know, when you follow God, there's going to be people that call you all kinds of names. You better get used to it. There's people going to pro- persecute you and maybe even prosecute you for your faith. That day may be coming. Are you prepared? Are you prepared? Will, will you stand when it's not easy to stand? So Elijah does what God asks him to do, and he shows up. And Ahab, right off the bat, so is it really you, you troublemaker of Israel? And Elijah says these words, I've made no trouble for Israel. Elijah replied, you and your family are troublemakers, for you have refused to obey the commands of the Lord and have worshipped the images of Baal instead. Now summon all of Israel to join me at Mount Carmel, along with the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who were supported by Jezebel. So Ahab summoned all the people of Israel and all the prophets to Mount Carmel. Then Elijah stood in front of them and said, How much longer will you waver, hobbling between two points? So he's looking at all the prophets of Baal. He's looking at the king, and he's looking at the children of Israel. And he said, How long will you waver between two points? Some of us, in fact, all of us are probably guilty of this. Wavering in between two points of whether I trust God or I don't trust God. Because when you don't trust him and you put your trust in other things, I hate to tell you, but you're just like a prophet of Baal because it's an idol. Anything that you trust more in than you trust in God himself is an idol. And the truth hurts, and I won't get many amens on that this morning. See, not one. Where's John at today? I need some amens, John. (laughs) How much longer will you waver hobbling between two opinions? That may be my question for you today. If the Lord is God, follow him, Elijah said. But if Baal is God, then follow him. But the people were completely silent. And Elijah challenges these men and these women to a showdown. He tells them, prepare sacrifice. Pray over your sacrifice. And the God who shows up in fire and consumes the sacrifice is the true God. That's who the true God is. It's interesting because Baal is the fertility God and the sky God, the God of storms, the God of rains, the God of lightning. Surely he could strike the bull with lightning and consume it if he's really a God. The problem is they're serving a God that is not real. They're serving an idol. And Elijah mocks them. He makes fun of them. In fact, it gets so bad that the prophets of Baal are dancing around the wooden altar that they, they, they built where their, their cow has been prepared. And they're dancing around it. And they're cutting themselves and throwing their own blood on the sacrifice, begging their God to consume it. And the more they dance and the more they chant, the more Elijah makes fun of them. Because, see, Elijah knows who the true and living God is. And when you know who God is, and there's no doubt in your mind who God is, you know that no one else can do the miraculous. Only he can do it. And it says in 1 Kings 18, 36, at the usual time for offering the evening sacrifice, Now, Elijah does everything in order according to the order of God and how God says it needs to happen. 
the usual time for offering the eager evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet walked up to the altar and prayed, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, prove today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. Prove that I have done all this at your command. O Lord, answer me. Answer me so these people will know. said last week, God always wants to bring you to himself. Elijah goes to the principles of what he knows who God is, who wants to bring people to him. And he said, God, that you have brought them back to yourself. And immediately the fire of the Lord flashed down from saw it. They fell down on the ground and they cried, the Lord, he is God. Yes, the Lord is God. But he does it in order. Elijah knows the order and the laws and the rules of God. He goes and he rebuilds the altar. See, the altar hadn't been taken care of. So he rebuilds the altar in the proper fashion. He sacrifices the bull in the proper fashion. And he puts everything in the proper order, which the prophets of Baal didn't even know. They did it their way instead of God's way. And they were doing it with the wrong God. The truth is when you, you worship an idol and you expect it to provide for you or to do something or to take care of you, it will never come through. Only he does. But you have to trust in him and not in a thing. We put trust in our relationships. We put trust in our finances, in our finances, in our bank accounts. We put trust in our 401ks. We put trust in our kids. We put trust, I'm going to tell you something. If you put trust in people, people will always let you down. People will always disappoint you, and people always act out of the ordinary. I don't care who they are. You hang around me enough, I'm probably going to hurt your feelings. Not on purpose, but you're going to take something I say probably out of context, and it's probably going to make you mad. Because we all do it, because we're all human, no one's perfect. But the truth is, that's why I tell people I put my pants on one leg at a time, just like them. I don't want you looking to me. I want you looking to him. Truth is, if you look to me, you're going to be disappointed. Because I'm just a dude. I'm going to say the wrong thing. I'm going to mess up words like fibromyalgia and say fibromyalgia. I'm going to say things wrong. I'm going to do things wrong. Why? Because I'm not perfect. And the truth is, I'm not trying to be perfect. I'm just trying to serve God with all of my heart. And I'm going to ask for forgiveness every day. I ask for forgiveness every night. I wake up in the morning and I ask for forgiveness. And I ask that God makes me a better person on that day. And I put all my trust in Him and I'm going to give everything that I can give. I'm going to give 110%. Why? Because I want to serve a true and a living God. And I know that if I'm consistent enough, I'm going to get moments just like this, just like Elijah got in his life. I think Elijah just walked out of there, called 450 prophets of Baal, called a whole nation to the mountainside, and just guessed and said, well, Hopefully God shows up today. No, he lived the lifestyle of prayer. He had heard from God. He knew who God was. God lived in him. And God operated through him. Why? Because he was consistent. And in his consistency, the suddenly happened. And God showed up when he spoke because he knew who God was, and he did things in the proper order that God called him to do them. And then all of a sudden, fire from heaven consumed everything there. And the people fell on their faces on the ground and cried out, The Lord, he is God. Yes, the Lord, he is God. See, because when we're consistent, and we follow God in a true way, and we love people with all of our heart, all of a sudden, the suddenly happens. And that person you never dreamed of that would come to church will walk through the doors. 
because of your consistency. All of a sudden, suddenly there's miracles. The family member you've been praying for for 20-something years all of a sudden says, I'm tired of seeing you get all the miracles. I want to serve the God that you serve. Because all of a sudden, in your consistency, that's when God shows up and a whole nation falls on their face before God and repents and realizes who God is once again. God, Elijah went back to God's law. Mount Carmel is the mountain of decision. You've got to decide whom this day you will serve. Verse, 20 sa- verse 21 says, How much longer will you waver hobbling between two opinions, dancing between two decisions of whether you'll serve God or not serve God, whether you'll go to the house of God or just stay home, whether, whether you'll serve people or, or you'll just attend. There's decisions that we have to make. The people of Israel are caught between between I can and I can't. And things are going wrong in their life and they start chasing idols. They chase who's supposed to be the God of the sky and of the storms because they've been caught in a drought, not realizing that God's the only one that can bring rain because God's the one who stopped the rain. God cut them off from the rain, the very thing they were trusting from. See, it's usually the thing that you're putting your trust in other than God that God will cut off in your life. If you're putting your faith in relationships instead of a God, God will usually cut that relationship off. If you're putting faith in your money instead of God, that's when you'll start having financial problems in your life. Because God will cut the thing that you're idolizing in your life out of your life so that you turn back to him. It's just we are too ignorant to see it until fire comes down and boom, flashes right in front of us. And all of a sudden we need a fire moment to turn back to God. We shouldn't have to have a fire moment. We should trust God in every area of our lives and we won't have things getting cut out of our lives. It's the very thing that you don't trust God with. That's the very area that you'll struggle with because God's trying to do something in your life. Does that make sense this morning? They are sacrificing and praying for rain, and yet it's not working, and it's never going to work because they're not trusting God. See, when you can call yourself God's chosen people like Israel did, yet worship another God. Calling yourself children of God, yet looking to Bell as your source. Elijah said, it's time, and it's time to decide. How many people call themselves Christians and yet worship other gods? There are lots. I know people who've stayed home on a Sunday morning instead of going to church because their car needed cleaning. I know people that have sacrificed Sunday morning going to worship God because they had something else more important. And I'm not saying it's not okay to do that every once in a while. To go out of town and go on vacation. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is when we put things in our lives that are more important than the house of God and God himself, we're creating idols in our life. We're praying, we're fasting, we're here today. But do you have some mountains of decision that you need to make in your life? Is it time for you to choose who you're going to serve? See, the truth is we can't serve God at any level in our life if we're serving other gods. Because it just doesn't work. You can't serve two gods at the same time. In America today, I think one of, the, one of the biggest idols that we have as Americans today are our children. I think people worship their children at a high level. They put their kids before they put God. I think we do it with other areas of our life too. Events, things. We have to choose who's most important in our life. It's easy to start worshiping idols, and I'll tell you how it happens. You stop showing up to worship God with other people. You quit going to church, and all of a sudden, you wake up one day, and you ain't been to church in months. It's easy. 
Maybe you're a person of influence and all of a sudden you started following someone else and you follow the coolest, latest thing. Maybe you let the altar that you have in your life where you worship God, your prayer closet or something, fall into disrepair. And, and when that happens, you stop remembering who God is in your life and what he's done for you. See, this is not just a place of And when we forget remembering what God has done for us, it allows the enemy to slip in and to put other things of importance in front of us. Some of us, our narrative is we forgot what God has done. And this, our story used to be, but God did this. And then God showed up and he healed me. And God set me free. And God saved me. And God changed me. And then it becomes a different story. You know, well, I, I did this, and I did that, and I've done this, and I've done that. Or, you know, my boss gave me a bonus, and, or, or my company did this for me. Your boss and your company ain't your provider. We quit, get, we quit giving God the glory for the little things that happen in our life. And, well, I work for a great company. Instead of I serve a great God, and God, God blessed me this week, and I got a bonus you couldn't believe. And we start giving credit to other things. I'm not trying to be hard on you this morning. I'm just trying to open eyes to tell you that we've got to get to a place where God is the number one thing in our lives in order to go where God wants to take us. Not only as a people, not only as a person, not only as an individual, but corporately as a church. There's somewhere that God wants us to take the body of Christ, and we have to all get ready. we got to be in unity. Where were they when they were in the upper room and the Holy Spirit fell? It said they were, they were unified. They were all together in, in one accord. We've got to get to the place where we're all operating at the same place and that the most important thing in our life is finding God in a real way. Amen. But in order to do that, we have to recognize idols and we have to decide to serve God. Some people have been praying for a long time for a breakthrough and you don't know why you haven't gotten it. You have to get rid of all the idols in your life before you're going to see a breakthrough. The children of Israel wasted years serving Baal instead of turning to God. Today we're at the mountain of what I call decision, Mount Car Carmel. It was the mountain of decision for the children of Israel on who they were going to serve. Were they going to serve the real God or serve fake gods? And the truth is, I hope today, as we're at the bottom of this mountain, and we're looking at what God has done, that we decide to follow God in a real way. How did Elijah know the showdown would work? I mean, it's huge faith, isn't it? Huge faith that you're going to call everybody there to the mountain. The queen's there. There's 850 prophets and priests, the entire nation. But see, Elijah never left the place of remembering who God was. And he'd been consistent for so long, knowing who he, his God was for so long, that he knew that God would show up. It was his history that got him through. He remembered when the raven brought him food. He remembered when the angel made him a cake. He remembered when the widow took her last cake and made it and gave it to him. See, daily dependence on God leads to great faith. Consistency leads to the suddenly. We're in the midst of the Super Bowl we're coming up here in a few weeks, and we're watching the greatest athletes in the world play each other week by week until we get the two best teams in America to play a game called football. And those athletes didn't just show up and play a game. They don't just go out and make a great play on, on game day. They've been working on that route, that skill. They've been punishing their bodies. They've been pounding, pounding every bone and every muscle they have and getting it in the best optimum shape in the world so that they could go play that game in an optimum level. 
Elijah had been depending on God for three years. He walked to that bottom of that mountain and said, God ain't left me one day yet. I ain't went hungry one day yet. If God ain't left me in the middle of a famine, he's never going to leave me. And he walks up to that mountain knowing who God is. Just like David. Look, David, David didn't walk up to that giant first. He'd had consistency in his life. He didn't just go face a giant. He first faced the lion, and then he faced the bear, and then he faced the giant. See, Jesus didn't just get raised from the dead. He didn't just go walk up to the cross. Jesus did it every single day. He healed the sick. He raised the dead long before he got to the cross. Why was he able to go to the cross? Because he knew who his daddy was. And the deal is, you'll never be able to face your crosses in life until you know who your daddy is. Until you know who God is without a shadow of a doubt. See, Elijah was following God's word. He didn't just get bored with the widow and decide to end the drought. He didn't just go pick a fight with Ahab on his own. 1 Kings 18.1 says, go and present yourself to Ahab. This is what God told him to do. 1 Kings 18.36, prove that I've done all of this at your command. Elijah said, prove that I've done all this at your command, God. Show up. Now's the time, right now. <coughs> but he knew how to hear from God. He knew how to walk with God. He knew how to talk with God. That's what fasting and prayer is all about. It's about silencing the loudness of, of chewing and the loudness of all the things in your world and getting alone a little bit with God. Fasting reveals heart issues. It reveals things in your life that you need to fix. See, Elijah just knew he was a servant. And he knew it was just God's word that he was following. And because he was a servant, and because he was following God's word, he knew God would show up. Because God's word can never lie. The battle was over, but the miracle got delayed a little bit. Elijah kills every prophet. We see in 1 Kings 18, 41, Elijah said to Ahab, Go get something to eat and drink, for I hear a mighty rainstorm coming. See, he told him it was going to rain. It ain't rained yet. So Ahab went to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Mount Carmel and bowed low to the ground, and he prayed with his face between his knees. Just because you ain't seen your miracle yet, don't stop praying. And then he said to his servant, go and look out toward the sea. Servant went and looked, and he returned to Elijah and said, I didn't see anything. I went and looked out towards the sea, Elijah. There ain't nothing. You got some naysayers in your life? Let me tell you how to handle the naysayers of life that say they don't see a miracle. They don't see anything. Somebody prays for you, I'll just tell them, no, I ain't getting my miracle. Why would you want to speak that on your life? Say, you know, it, it hasn't completely happened yet, but it's feeling better. It's going better. God, God, God's doing something. Never give up. It's not an instant thing all the time. God doesn't have to just suddenly do it. He can, he can suddenly do it when he wants to suddenly do it. And do as we want it when we want it. We want it our way, all the way, all the time. So the servant says, I ain't seen anything. And seven times Elijah climbed that mountain again and told him, go and look. And finally the seventh time, doesn't matter how many times they've told you no. Tell them to go look again. And his servant told him, Elijah, I saw a little cloud about the size of a man's hand rising from the sea. He saw a cloud that big around. Yeah, that big around. Rising from the sea. 
he probably could have came back and said, Elijah, I don't see anything. But after seven times, after seven times, he might have seen a mirage. He just might have wanted to tell Elijah, I can see a cloud the size of a man's hand. Sometimes you got to look really hard to see what God's doing. But what does that do? He sees the cloud the size of a man's hand rising from the sea. And Elijah shouted. But see, Elijah knew who his God was. All he needed was just a little bit of the miracle to know that it was coming. All he needed was just a little bit to build his faith. And, and, and Elijah shouted, hurry to Ahab and tell him, climb into your chariot and go back home. If you don't hurry, the rain will stop you. And soon the sky was black with clouds and a heavy wind brought a terrific rainstorm, and Ahab left quickly for Jezreel. And then the Lord gave special strength to Elijah. He tucked his cloak into his belt and ran ahead of Ahab's chariot all the way to the entrance of Jezreel. The man outran a chariot. Now, don't you think God helped him just a little bit? I don't know about you, but I've never seen a man outran a horse. I don't know that Hussein Bolt could run as far as as this man just ran, Elijah just ran, and beat Ahab all the way back to Jezreel. See, well, there was that suddenly moment. Sometimes we want our suddenlies to be big like the fire coming down from heaven. But suddenly there was a little cloud. And that little cloud was enough for Elijah to shout at the top of his lungs. Because he knew the miracle was on the way. The truth is, what are you seeing today when you look? And how many times are you looking? Or did you give up on the first try? Or are you still praying? See, you might, you might have been in a fight, but I hear the sound of rain. Maybe it's a blessing you've been chasing for three years. Maybe you've been chasing it for five years. Maybe you've been chasing it every day since your daughter or your son was born. Maybe you've been chasing it and wondering, will the miracle of God happen in their life? See, suddenlies don't happen quickly, but they do happen suddenly. Three years in the making, consisting, defeating idols, praying fervently. See, rain equals the blessings of God. Rain equals a harvest would come. Rain, rain equals fruit would be born. You've been in a fight, but I hear the sound of rain. See, the blessing you've been chasing, whether it's three years, whether it's ten years, the harvest you've been desperately needing. You may be out of energy, you may be out of money, you may be out of time, but as long as you don't run out of faith, the size of a mustard seed, you're not out of the fight. I believe that God is about to show up and God's about to do some great things. Not only in your life, but in this church. I've been praying for a harvest for the last 14 days. I've been praying for seasons of drought and seasons of famine to end in your life. And the truth is, things are changing because God is good. Whether you can see him in your situation or not, there's one thing that is for certain. God is good. And the name of Jesus is above every name. It doesn't matter what you've been facing in your life. God is good. It doesn't matter what you've gone through in your life. God is good. It doesn't matter what somebody else has told you, God is good. And he's good all the time. It doesn't matter if you can see it. It doesn't matter if death has been at your door. It doesn't matter what's happening in your life. The promises of God are still true. Doesn't matter if your back is hurt for 25 years. The promises of God are true. That by his faith, you can be restored. If you have the faith of a mustard seed, you can see that mountain move in your life. You just got to have faith. We see Jesus. He walks up, and they've done told him days before that Lazarus had died, and he didn't even get in a hurry. Why didn't Jesus get in a hurry when Lazarus was dead and run and panic? He knew who his daddy was. 
He knew he could walk there and take his time and deal with the other issues on the way. And when he got there, he said, Lazarus isn't dead. He's just sleeping. The truth is, the things in your life that you think are dead, they're not dead. You just haven't said the the right name over them. You've been declaring the wrong stuff. Some of you have been saying, well, you just don't, you haven't seen my bank account, Pastor. No, you ain't seen mine either. But I know this much. It says in the Word of God, if He'll feed the birds of the field every single day, He'll take care of you. Why are you trusting in what's in your bank account anyway? Are you not a child of God? Is He not your daddy? Does He not take care of you? If the dogs have the crumbs off the master's table, don't you think that he can't drop something down on your behalf and take care of you and give you the miracle you need? Why did you quit praying? Why did you quit believing? Why did you get frustrated? It doesn't matter if there's not a cloud in the sky. It doesn't matter what your bank says. It doesn't matter what people say. The only thing that matters is what God says. It doesn't matter if the the doctor tells you you have six months to live. You got every day to live that God says you have to live. And only he gets to tell you when you die. It was him that breathed life into you in the beginning. And it's him that takes life from you in the end. And we think that life is so temporary that we just go. And it's over. It's not over. Your best days are ahead. My God, I know who my God is. I'm going to leave this place, and I'm going to do what Elijah did. I'm going to shout on my way up to heaven. The angels are going to carry me like they carried the beggar Lazarus to the bosom of Abraham. They're going to carry me right to the pearly gates, and there my Jesus is going to be. And I'm going to get excited. I don't care what my bank, I don't care how much money I take with me. You can't take it with you anyway. Ever seen a Brinks truck back up at a cemetery? But you're worried about it today. And you know what? It's important to God that you're worried about it because he cares for you. But until you learn to trust in him 100% and cast all your cares on him, your cares are your idols. Because you put more faith in those problems and in those cares than you put in your God. Stand with me today. We sing an old song, cast your cares on him for he cares for you. The truth is God wants so much more for your life than where you're living right now. He's just waiting on you to trust him. And I've gone a little long today and I'm gonna continue to go for a second. Because this is important. I just want you to think about issues you have in your life some of you might, might have given too much credit to your issues. Maybe some of you don't have issues at all. Some, maybe some year your stock looks good, things look great. And you're not worried at all about anything. But you put all your trust in the fact that you've got enough saved up to retire and you've got enough to live life. Truth is, your faith shouldn't be in that thing anyway. We read a parable in the Bible where a man stored up, stored up way to, he built bigger barns to store it all up. And God said he was wrong. God took him right there at that instance because he put more faith in the stuff than he did in God. The truth is we had to put our faith in our God. And today you might have some areas of your life and some things in your life that you put way too much faith in. Maybe you just need to give them to God this morning. He said, God, I don't want anything ahead of you. God, I don't want anything ahead of you. I want you to be first, front, and center above all things. Don't let there be a person. Don't let there be a relationship. Don't let there be an item that I have put ahead of you, God. Only you get first place in my life. It says, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added to you. 
You want the things that you've always desired? When you desire him and he knows it, he takes care of all the rest. But you got to put him first. Some of us need to reprioritize and, and say, God, are you truly first today? Are you the first thing I think of when I wake up in the morning? Is everything that I'm doing in my day pointed towards you? And are you such a priority that I'm, I'm, I'm going to save the lost and see people set free? Well, you don't understand, Pastor. You know, I, I have a full-time job, and it's just hard. Paul made tents full-time. They would show up at his workplace while he was working because the anointing of God was so strong in his life. And they'd pick up his sweat towels and they'd walk down the street and they'd throw them on people and they would be healed. Why? Because Paul knew who God was and it consumed him. The presence of God consumed him because he'd get into the presence of God and it would saturate him in such a way that it would just come out of the pores of his skin and they drop the presence of God on somebody and they'd be healed. It wasn't Paul, it was God. Are you willing to pay the price to get close enough to God to see the suddenly happen, to see the miraculous happen, to not just live a normal, everyday life? There's lots of people that live normal, ordinary lives. I don't wanna live an ordinary life. I don't care if there's pain associated. I don't care if people are chasing me. I don't care if I'm getting death threats. I don't care any of it. I just want to follow Jesus at a high level so that I can see the suddenly because the suddenly equals people finding Jesus in a real way. Father, today we love you. We thank you for who you are. If there's anything in our hearts or in our lives that's not of you, we give it to you today. I'm going to ask our prayer partners to come. If you've never asked Jesus into your heart and you need to do that this morning, our prayer partners are here. If, if you're at home today and you never asked Jesus, give us a like, some hands up on the screen. Uh, send us a, a personal message and we'll, we'll message you back. We want you to find Jesus in a real way. It's as easy as saying, Jesus, I admit I'm a sinner, but I believe you died and you rose again. So I confess you as my Lord and Savior. And he saves you right then. All you got to do is say a prayer and say, Jesus, save me. And he saves you. It says, everyone that calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Call on his name this morning. He'll save you right where you're at. Maybe you need a miracle in your life. Maybe you need to get rid of some models in your life. This altar is where you do it. Elijah rebuilt the altar in a proper way. And he went at the time where the altar was supposed to be there, and God showed up. This altar is a proper place of worship. It's a proper place to come and find God in a real way. And if you'll come down to this altar at the proper time, which is right now, God will do a miracle in your life, no matter what it is. You need a financial miracle, I serve a God that does financial miracles. You need a healing in your life, He'll do healing in your life. You got anxiety, He'll take it away. He'll give you peace. He'll give you grace. So today as we worship, our altars are open. If you need to leave today, you can quietly slip out as we worship. But let's worship Jesus and come to his altar today and just say, God, I need you. Go ahead, David.